Who doesn't love a good Pulp Fiction piece? You know, stories that feel larger than life. Characters and adventurers feel sensational, lurid, and even raunchy. And oh honey, there was, and technically are, lots of queer goodness in pulp stories. After all, there was a whole subsection of queer pulp back in the 50s, 60s, and 40s. So, what if I told you that there was a tabletop game that combined four things? Pulpy detective dramas, queer narratives, the highs and lows of 1970s and 1960s cultural politics, and has you battling elgin horrors while chilling on an awesome beach town. Oh yes, I'm talking about the 2022 indie tabletop RPG that is all of that and more. Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach. So, today I'll be discussing a bit of its mechanics, themes, and reflecting on my experiences playing and running this game. Specifically, we'll see how Moonlight can both reflect the beauty of the queer and trans experience and history, while not being limited by the time period and or subject manner. So sleuths, grab your surfboards, apply your sunscreen, and powder your beautiful queer noses, cause we are taking a vacation to the queer and mythos-laden seaside village, Rosevel Beach. Moonlight on Rosevel Beach is a pulp cosmic horror RPG that is queer as hell. You play sleuths uncovering steamy and horrifying mysteries of the eldritch and cosmic variety in the 1970s beach town named Rosevel Beach. This game was featured at the NES Tabletop RPG Award as a judge's spotlight in 2023. I also believe I covered it back in my 2023 retrospective video. The game was crowdfunded back in November 2021 with great success by R. Rook Studios. Its combination of pulpy queer goodness involves character creation that's based off of an origin system that pulls from many queer and pulpy archetypes. It uses a dice pool system using D6s. Furthermore, the book is very well laid out with gorgeous pulp art from the 60s and prior. Finally, there is a detailed GM section. It explains the basics on starting a mystery, giving clues, as well as escalating situations. For a relatively small price, you're getting a full game and one that's not that hard to read or understand. You can easily pick this game up now and get playing in a couple of hours, even less. All sloops in Moonlight on Rosebell Beach have an origin story, a job, strange events that tie them not only to their other fellow sloops, but to the beachside town as well. And finally, troubles, comforts, and allies. These are core to our sloop and tie them not only to Roosevelt Beach, but to the others that live in the cabana as well. Your origin story is the archetype that fits your character. It will be what defines your sloop and gives you some of your skills, troubles, and other personal aspects to your character. There are six in the main book. The Fresh Face, The Scandalous, The Shifter, The Witch, The Familiar, and finally The Stranger. And for the sake of this example, let's choose The Scandalous. Why? Because gay reasons. As stated in the book, you were doing fine. You had a life. Maybe you had made some mistakes, but you were keeping things together. Then the scandal happened. Now you're keeping your head down and trying to find happiness again. First, roll your age for that specific origin, or just choose. And secondly, in every origin, you pick two backgrounds, then roll two skills. If you roll exactly the same, then you can just pick another skill. Or you can just talk to your GM. For instance, Jean Reeves is 35 years old. I rolled two D6s and got two fives, which gives me the background editorial associate. And I decided to choose the skills charming and carousing. So the scandal that we chose together at the table was this same sex affair that Jean and some high executive at his previous editorial company participated in. However, Gene was quickly, uh, let's say, ostracized from his community and ostracized from his company. So he needed a lot of help to get out of this messy issue. 
Jean had help from a man named Foster, but Jean did not exactly think about paying this guy back or really asking for any future help. Jean just kind of left town when he realized that he could just do that. And unfortunately, Foster will come back. It's just a matter of time. Finally, when Gene got to Roosevelt Beach, he took the job piano player at the Cedar Point Hotel. He became a little bit more friendly while there too, earning him, as you can tell, the friendly skill. Finally, let's move on to strange events. Strange events tie you to the other characters in Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach. Each sleuth could choose one of the strange experiences listed in the book. And these strange experiences are shared between multiple characters. In this case, Gene and his housemate, AJ Springer, a fresh face in Rosebell, saw a shadowy figure that hissed both of their names and ran away one misty night on a beach. From this event, Gene gained the running skill because he was not going to be caught dead. Finally, to round out Gene, let's choose his troubles, allies, and companies. Troubles are someone or something you're hiding from, you owe, you relied on, or even someone you hurt. Allies are folks you can count on around town or your fellow sleuths. And these are generated via character creation and via your skill progressions. So these should be filled out while you're creating your origin story, while you're creating the other sleuths, and while you're discussing your background in the game. And last but not least, our comfort. Comforts are separated into three types of comforts. One being a special place, a place where the character goes to pull themselves together. Two being a special memento, something your character keeps in their room or on their person that reminds them of someone or something special. And finally, the special person. It's someone you go to when things are really tough. And in this case, let's say Jean's special place might be the Cedar Bar, actually. And with that, we have Gene Reeves, a charming piano player at the Cedar Point. He doesn't ever like talking much about his past and even less about his relationships. However, if you have any mysterious happenings, feel free to call him and his friend AJ, and they will be there to save the day or fail miserably and go clubbing instead of the cabana. As for the dice pool and dice mechanics, when you are investigating something or doing anything risky, such as casting magic or chasing down a baddie, that's where dice will come handy. Only risky actions provide rolls. When you head to danger, knowing what you're facing, you gather a pool of dice and roll. You as a sloop get 1d6 already. The rest is built depending on a number of circumstances as shown here. So, with this example, Jean and AJ are chasing down a warlock who turned some fellow compatriots into fish after a heated argument on who was the better choice for tonight's song at the Cedar Point. So, Jean gets a 1d6 for being a sleuth, not being injured or scarred that would affect him running. He has a relevant skill, which is running. And let's say AJ is throwing mud or glass at the assailant to slow him down, thus helping Jean. This will give Jean multiple dice, i.e. four dice. So let's go ahead and roll. We get a one, another one, a five, and a six. And with those dice rolls, we can allot those to a number of tables as shown here. When you have multiple dice, you can apply the highest numbers to the goal and clue. And in this case, Jean can apply the six to goal and the five to clues, meaning Jean catches up to the warlock and even learns who this warlock is. And there are no consequences for this action because you rolled really well. But if Jean was chasing this assailant while he had an injured leg and was alone, that would change the pool to a 2d6. In this case, let's say we roll a two and a one. Not only does Jean fail their goal, but maybe Jean is frightened when the warlock shoots out some thick miasma, showing him a horrifying vision from his past and thus giving him a scared condition that will hamper him until he resolves it via, say, using one of his comforts or a ally. And those are the basics to Moonlight on Rollsville Beach for mechanics. 
The same logic applies to magic rolls as well, with some slight differentiation due to the witch or the familiar having access to magic, usually. So from the mechanics, you can see that your actions, failures, and mysteries revolve around the community of Roseville Beach. Your sloops are interconnected into the community, and your actions, scares, and investigations lead you into meeting a wide variety of queer and trans folk who live in Roseville. And unfortunately, your sloops will also encounter folks outside of Roseville who may or may not have ill intention and or have lots of internalized and or external homophobia, transphobia, and bigotry. So this looks like a game that deals with queer politics and the queer happenings, both inside Roseville as well as outside. And I think it's worth looking at those themes in the broader context of queer history during the late 1960s, 70s, and a little bit before all of that. In the 1960s, there were strict gender and heteronormative roles structurally and culturally. Heteronormativity, describing social, material, and institutional practices that construct heterosexuality as a default, normal, and natural sexual orientation. These norms were amidst the quote-unquote rapid suburbanization, increasing birth rates, and heightened Cold War tensions that existed in the 1960s. This means that the priority of heterosexual nuclear families, aka a male breadwinner and a stay-at-home mother, were prioritized because of the historical period that was in. Mark Stein, in his article Satire, Parody, and Comedy in the 1950s and 60s, expands on this. He states, After the war, much of North American culture idealized normative heterosexuality as the key to economic affluence, family happiness, social success, and national security. And in terms of looking at social success and economic influence, let's look at pulp magazines of the 1960s. Adventure magazines in the 1950s and 1960s depicted the ideal man as both heroic warrior and sexual conqueror. War stories illustrated the exploits of courageous soldiers fighting against the savage enemy in foreign lands and defending democracy in a harsh world with the threat from evil actors always seem lurking. Sex underscored nearly all of these tales with pulp heroes rewarded with beautiful, seductive women as a kind of payoff for their combat victories. What this means is that anything and or anyone that threatened heteronormativity, cisnormativity, nuclear family, was met with plenty of scrutiny, harm, and multiple forms of violence from governmental to state and individual. Governmental-wise, in the 1950s, United States Senate had hearings on homosexuals and quote-unquote other sexual perverts. The U.S. was trying to purge up to thousands of working gay and lesbian men, women, and peoples from government agencies due to the fervent hatred of homophobia because politicians knew it worked in their favor to win votes. But let's move away from institutional practices. Similar to our current queer trans period, there were plenty of assimilationist gays that internalized the fears and anxieties of the straight cis world. This came out, I know, there we go with the pun, in how some gay men internalize homophobia and prefer masculinity and heteronormativity to hold them to their jobs, professions, and livelihoods. There were plenty of well-meaning liberals believed that they could teach the effeminacies out of some swishes. Now, swish, or swishes, is an old term to refer to a more effeminate gay man. This is mainly used by middle-class gay men to refer to, well, effeminate gay men. Some gay men suggested that these switches needed group hypnotherapy sessions in states like Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles in order to cure gay men of their feminine nature. This cure was to help switches open, quote, in the work-a-day world, closed quote. Yikes. Furthermore, one magazine, the first gay rights organization in the U.S., had readers accusing femme gays of trying to take over the magazine when content was seen too effeminate. Some attacks in one magazine were happening while One Inc. tried to construct a homosexual bill of rights back in the 1960s. Some queer men in the magazine wrote this. We'd be more widely accepted if the public didn't think we were all swishes. Attempts should be made to educate and possibly eliminate the public swish. The normal homo represents these jerks as much as the heterosexual does, I believe. I think that these people who call each other she, etc., are sick. This is part of a syndrome that includes bitchiness and irresponsibility. I doubt whether you'll lose much support by offending these people. 
This means that while one and many gay and lesbian activists were organizing for gay men's rights and lesbians' rights, they removed entire swaths of effeminate gay men from their organizing work, which all I gotta say is awful because looking for liberation for a certain group of people because they act respectable is not liberatory work. Unfortunately, this extended to transgender and gender non-conforming folks as well. A combination of respectability politics and system activity isolated and or separated our transgender and gender non-conforming comrades. Leslie Feinberg, a transgender activist and author, describes her experience in the 1950s as an era marked by rigidly enforced social conformity and fear of difference. Queer organizations like the Mattachine Society prioritized liberal reform agendas and generally sought to demonstrate that gay people could be virtuous, contributing members to society, as stated in Rethinking Gay and Lesbian Movement by Mark Stein. Compared with the many demonstrations in the late 1960s, most homophile protests were small, and the self-imposed dress codes used in some of them, mandating jackets and ties for men and dresses and skirts for women, showed that many homophile militants were not as radicalized as were other activists in this era. This performance of respectability to align themselves with cisnormativity and heteronormativity obviously would affect trans activists as well in how they did organizing work and how they were represented in the media. Christine Jorgensen was an American actress and activist known as the first person to become widely known in the United States for having gender-affirming surgery. However, Christine corresponded to the image of femininity that was most idealized in the mid-20th century, Skidmore states. As a blonde, heterosexual, and domestically oriented woman, Jorgensen's appearance in mainstream press introduced readers to the concept of transsexuality and yet simultaneously assured them of continued dominance of gender roles forged in reference to white heteropatriarchy. This is a twofold problem. First, trans and gender nonconforming black and brown folk were essentially erased from history and media despite them very much existing. Books like Black on Both Sides by C. Riley Snorton go into extensive depth on the intersections of the Black trans identity in the U.S. even prior to 1950s. Secondly, gays and lesbians that aligned themselves with respectability politics were hostile to trans folk as well as queer folk who did not fit into particular narrow acceptance of 1960s and 70s heteronormative and cisnormative culture. I think this is most shown in how trans-specific organizations like STAR or Tau, or QLF, formed as a result of reformist, assimilationist, and TERFs in gay and lesbian spaces. For example, in the early 70s, TERFs threatened violence against trans women in lesbian and femme spaces. Trans activist, hippie, and artist Beth Elliott at the 1973 West Coast Lesbian Feminist Conference was specifically ridiculed on stage at a conference by TERFs. With all this historical backdrop, I would conclude this personally in relation to Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach. The queer and trans experience leading into the time period of MIRB is tumultuous as much as it is uplifting. There were many queer and trans liberatory organizations fighting for the right to exist alongside many fronts, such as healthcare and housing, to name a few. However, there were facts like police brutality, turf, respectability politics, and governmental institutions that made life a living hell. And you might be thinking, why the hell does any of this have to do with Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach? Could you not just run it without any of that historical context? Yes, you can entirely run it without that historical context, but it is that historical context that makes Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach as a premise really awesome. Okay, it might not make sense now, but let's look at some examples. Take the fresh face. You're an adult now, and you're ready to live your own life. Whether you intend to settle down for a while in Roseville Beach or just take a break for the summer, it's a chance for you to get out on your own. One thing is for sure, you're not in Kansas anymore. Fresh Face is a younger adult who happens across Roseville Beach. They likely are new to queer culture. Maybe they were ostracized from their home for their queerness. Maybe they found some sort of seedy pulp magazine mentioning Roseville Beach once or twice. So, they packed up their things and head off to gayer pastures, and that looked like Roosevelt Beach. Maybe they are deeply closeted and or hold assimilationist views, and they may have gone to Roosevelt Beach because they are dealing with all that internalized bullcrap. Or let's look at the witch. The witch might be burdened by the respectability politics of the gay and lesbian communities of the 70s. 
It could also be a combination of the witch's hidden arcane powers and the unfortunate internalized queer phobic violence the witch may have received prior to their time in Roswell Beach. So you see, with just a bit of historical context, the pulpy fictional world of Roosevelt feels much more alive in its main characters. You could play a number of different scenarios by just applying some of that historical context as needed. The book helps with that on the lore side. For instance, they make a statement about calling the police in this game. The Maine and County Police used to regularly conduct gay baiting and queer bashing raids in Roosevelt Beach. They resent the court orders that prevent them from continuing to do so, and residents have very good reasons to distrust them. If anyone calls the police, the best possible result is that the police ignore the call. In line of LGBTQ history, the police are unreliable if we want to assume that graciously and dangerous and definitely harmful in most cases if we are not being gracious. That is another example of history aligning with Rosewall Beach. Let's also take the guest stars. Guest stars are characters you can use for players who want to drop in a session or few. These guest stars fill a wide variety of personalities and experiences across queer media and queer experience. From the spunky independent journalists to the oblivious but super supportive grandma, the lousy punk but chip on their shoulder but definitely has a heart of gold and a vinyl collection to prove how much of a snob they are. Or my personal favorite, the high school drama coach. I mean, how many drama coaches have you had that you know that are entirely cis and het, after all? Let me know down below in the comment section. No, seriously, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. So, in all of the examples, we can see how the queer past of the 50s, 60s, and 70s reflects onto Moonlight on Roswell Beach. Maybe you are a shifter dealing with asshole turps or fresh face trying to come to terms with internalized homophobia. Maybe it's all of those stories and more that can be unraveled as you investigate mysteries. Or it could be none of that. And in fact, the best advice I could give you is talk to your players, especially queer and trans players, about what kind of content you want in this game. You don't need to deal with respectability politics or the internalized transphobia that gay and lesbians had in the 60s, 50s, and 70s. Seriously, have a conversation about this before you dive into the game. But I do think it's important to talk about this stuff because this was relevant to queer and trans communities back then, and it also still is relevant now. This is going to sound corny, but Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach is a game that stands out amongst many of its horror RPG contemporaries. Call of Cthulhu and Delta Green deal with the fact that humanity is doomed by horrors beyond our comprehension, and no amount of struggle will ever mean anything. Dread deals with the unnerving tensions of, well, dread, and how death is the end all and be all for every living thing. Vason deals with the mythological creatures of the Victorian era while presenting deep questions on how technology and industrialization can bring about horrors both human and mystical. And the list of horror RPGs go on and on. And while you might think that Moonlight on Roseville Beach cannot be compared to the likes of Dark and Dreary Games, the ones I mentioned before, I would disagree. It's not that they can be compared one to one, but rather that they fit different niches for different groups. I think it's the combination of several tropes of horror and the queer realities that exist during those time periods that make this queer disco fear fest so captivating. It makes queer and trans sloops the stars despite the time period wanting to erase us. As stated in Boardwalks and Sorcery, A Creator's Guide to Roswell Beach, queerness and queer people may be unlikely to be in the majority in most fictional worlds, even in fictional fantasy worlds. But in shrinking our game worlds to the areas around the town, village, neighborhood, or other community, we're able to make queerness and other forms of marginalization, difference, and distinctiveness visible. Moonlight on Roswell Beach borrows the tropes of horror to explore the lives of people living in a queer community in a decidedly anti-queer time. But nevertheless, your sleuth goes to Roswell Beach, because while Cthulhu and horrors might be scary, queer realities can and are terrifying. For some queers, it's that sense of isolation you feel when you enter into a store or a restaurant or a bar. You get those stares from other customers. For others, it might be the rejection you feel from the community, and some others say that there is a certain way to act, a particular way to be seen, an unquestionable way to perform. 
There's always lines and barriers on how and when and where we can be queer. We internalize those fears and police ourselves and certainly police other communities. For some queer and trans people, a real fear is threat of homelessness or violence from one's intersections of being black and queer and brown and disabled and poor amongst all other identities. The idea that your existence is so criminalized and dehumanized that you are not deserving of the most basic amenities and that it's enforced by the government or by institutions is awful and scary. What is not more scary then than living in a world that seems so grand like the 70s but knowing it does not accept you on an institutional level? And all of those fears are palpable in the backdrop because many queer and trans folks throughout history understand that. So when given the chance to leave all that behind, knowingly or not, to face cosmic entities and arcane magic, set something about the queer experience in Roosevelt Beach and for those of us who play the game. What that is though, I'm struggling to parse through. What I do know is that despite all of that, your sleuths have made it to Roosevelt Beach for community and for a better life. Your sleuths stand against the secret societies, gothic terrors, and supernatural entities that threaten the people of Roosevelt and the relationships you've made along the way. I find that narrative of queries battling horrors of the cosmic despite the world yawned to be poetic in a way. For me, the game was a way for the players and the GM to connect back to all of the queer folk who've made this possible as well as to reflect on the queer and trans folk who've done great amount of harm and who continue to do great amount of harm. It's to remind us that the future we want for our community takes not one person, but a community like Roosevelt Beach and all the sleuths who are ready for the unknown, no matter how queer it might be. So yes, of course I'm going to recommend Moonlight on Roosevelt Beach. I didn't spend this amount of time recording and editing for you not to. Be sure to rate the game on itch.io and check the description box for the game and many of the supplemental materials that helped me run this game. Now, if you want a more in-depth look at character creation, check out this video review by a fellow RPG content creator on YouTube. Finally, special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Harrison Parker and Paul Volpe for continued contribution. You can help support the channel by checking out my Patreon down below in the description box as well as my coffee if you're interested. And as always, I'm your average everyday queer sleuth. Blurdy disposition and hope you all have an awesome day. Ciao.